here's where we are. Um, we have been spending most of our time talking about Nietzsche's relationship to his father, uh, why he is writing about his father in his autobiography, Eke Homo. And we talked about uh, a couple of important sections uh, where he mentions his father uh, in, in the first chapter of Eke Homo, Why I Am So Wise. This is going to be hard for you guys to catch up on. Uh, uh, why I Am So Wise has eight sections. Uh, there are four chapters in all of Eke Homo, and the first chapter, Why I Am So Wise, has eight sections. Uh, so far, we've talked about references to his father in sections 1, 4, and 5. And we began last time on talking, talking about uh, references to his father in, sections, in section 3. But it turned out that there, were, there, there was a, a revision in section 3. There's only one true section 3, and that's the section that was written after the end of December. But we only learned about that section a little while ago. And there's, so that the, the section that we thought was the original section 3 uh, has, is an important variant. So we want to look at the, the true section 3 that appeared after the end of December. And we'll also look at the uh, section 3 that it replaced, that was the, uh, uh, the one he had in, the, in, in place before the end of December. Both sections mention his father. Follow that? Okay. Now, uh, this, is, this is where we left off last time. This is the text of Why I Am So Wise, uh, uh, section 3. I think I know why I am so wise, section 3, after December 29th. This is the latest and the, and the, and the true version of section 3. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only going to concentrate on, on one point here, uh, uh, and it's the uh, issue of how extreme his language is in condemning his mother and his sister. Um, it's so extreme that it seems um, like it was uh, uh, part of a mental collapse. And that's generally the, the overarching theme that I'm, I'm always hammering away at, is I don't think that this is a book of someone experiencing a mental collapse. So I'm going to, we're going to read this, uh, section three, focus on the part that sounds like it's a, a, an overstatement of his uh, hatred for his mother and sister and uh, an overstatement of the terrible things they did to him. And then we're going to ask ourselves, uh, how, to, how we might read that section uh, so that it doesn't sound like that old statement at all, but might be a controlled and deliberate composition and not an out of control, overstated, psych psychopathic composition. Uh, I consider it a great privilege to have had such a father, the farmers to whom you preach. Uh, oops. The farmers to whom he preached, uh, for after he had lived several years at the uh, uh, court in his last years he was a preacher, he said that that was how an angel must go. Uh, so that's not so much about his father right here, but we'll get to some. And with this I touch up upon the question of descent. Uh, uh, descent in the, in the sense of, of, uh, of, 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 of breathing. Uh, much of this contains statements that either are not true or are extreme or sound crazy. And that's why we're reading it, to see uh, if we can provide alternative readings uh, from which it does not seem either insane or crazy. I'm a Polish nobleman, pure song. Pure song is, means uh, pure blood. Uh, with which not a drop of bad blood is mixed, ne least of all German blood. Of course, that's false. <laughs> he, he wasn't Polish. He, 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 he certainly had enough, he certainly wasn't a descendant of Polish nobility. Um, and uh, yes, he has, he was German on both sides of his family. So people, people did ancestral research, and, and there's 
absolutely no basis for this claim. So it's either false or it's a, uh, a figurative language for something else. So it's either a mental collapse in which he is delusional or it means something. Now, we said a little bit, I don't want to, I'll talk at great, greater length about the claim to be Polish at another time, but um, the, the first instance that I know of in which he talks about being Polish goes uh, all the way back to uh, summer of 1888, in which there was no question that, that of Nietzsche having gone crazy in, in, in 18, I'm sorry, did I say 18, I mean, uh, uh, in September of 1882, and there was no question of Nietzsche having been crazy in September of 1882, no, this is October of 18, this is uh, maybe, this is late December of 1888. So, <clears throat> it's not something new, we've had it uh, in, in this text before, and it has con a context and it means something. So we'll address that another time. Um, so we don't we don't automatically have to write that off as a delusion. Uh, but look at this text. This is what this is what I want to focus on. Um, and, a, and, a, and a very well-known Nietzsche scholar pointed to this text as evidence of Nietzsche's insanity at the time. Um, and that's all I want to address today is that uh, a way of reading this text so that it's a composition and not a readings of a manuscript. When I look for my profoundest opposite, uh, ineradicable vulgarity of the instincts, so what is most opposite to me is a kind of vulgarity at, of, at, of, of one's in, in, instincts for life. Uh, I always find my mother and sister, don't worry about exactly what uh, instincts mean and what vulgarity means here. Just look at the tone of the passage. I always find my mother and sister, to think of myself as related to such Kanai would be a blasphemy against my divinity. Kanai is the French word for the lowest class of the society. So those are the, you know, the shoemakers and the, and the bakers and the, the, the uneducated people. Uh, uh, this line, certainly, this line has often been pointed to as a sign that Nietzsche was insane in believing that he was a god. That's one of the signs of madness uh, or extreme egotism, and that has a word in Western culture. It's called megalomania. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this last time. Uh, so the line says, uh, to say that I'm related to such low-life people as my uh, mother and sister is, a, is to blaspheme against my divinity. However, uh, it's, it's, there's a section in his uh, great book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in which he says, uh, in which he's talking about uh, his, his concept of a new nobility. And he says, uh, well, for the future to unfold the way I think it should unfold, a new nobility is needed. And that's a, 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 a well-structured well concept in his writing. There's a, a whole uh, chapter in another book called uh, Beyond Good and Evil, called On What is Noble. Um, and, but in the section in uh, Zarathustra, in which he speaks about the new nobility, in this te text that I just mentioned, he said, what a new nobility is needed, or, the text continues, as I once said in the parable, precisely uh, this is godlike, uh, uh, namely that there are gods but no god. So there's a context in which new nobility and divinity are connected. Now, suppose we could make the argument that uh, his idea, that we could understand the way in which his idea of a new nobility can be understand, understood as a, as a kind of divine, as a kind of divinity. And maybe it's, maybe it's not a, an egotistical divinity. Uh, maybe it's, and maybe it's not even a personal divinity. Let's say we can understand that. Uh, I, I can maybe make that case. Uh, in any case, if we were to substitute the idea of new nobility, which is associated with divinity, this text then, for the first time, starts to make sense, when in, otherwise it's incoherent. Because then it reads, to think of myself as related to such can I, namely these lower status people of 
society, uh, that would be a blasphemy against my nobility. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, it, it's a, a slur or a, 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 a denial of my nobility to say that I'm related to my brother and sister. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail and explain why I think the concept of divinity is it's a pretty elaborated, well elaborated concept in Nietzsche's writings, and we can talk about the sense in which this idea of true nobility is not personal divinity of any kind, but an almost impersonal self-development. Okay, let, leaving that issue aside, so the, the one issue we're putting to some, somewhat to one side is the claim to be Polish, which is false, and we said we're trying to understand that. There's quite a lot to understand here to rescue Nietzsche from being crazy. And uh, we'll also put aside the, uh, the, the uh, full account of the way in which uh, the new nobility can be divine, but that not being a personal, uh, ego, ego maniacal expression. Let's leave those two to one side and continue looking at the horrible tone of this section. The treatment I have experienced at the hands of my mother and sister right up to this moment fills me with unspeakable horror. Here, that's, that's already pretty bad. Once, even, even, if, even, if, even if this is, even if his, even if his idea of new nobility can be understood not in a non-egotistical sense, this is still a pretty terrible thing to say about his mother and sister, which is where I want to keep the focus. Uh, the treatment that I have experienced at the hands of my own sister right at the moment fills me with unspeakable horror here. A perfectly infernal machine is at work, unerringly sure of the moment when a bloody wound can be inflicted on me in my most exalted moments. Or, in my most exalted moments, what, at such times, one likes all power to defend oneself against poisonous vermin. My mother and sister are such poisonous vermin. That's what happened. The text was intercepted, and it was suppressed. It was only until the late 60s that it was recovered, and with Nietzsche's instructions that this would be put in place of the, exist of the up until then, uh, uh, existing section three, only on section three. Uh, phys phys physiological contiguity makes such a, 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 a pre-established disharmony possible. Okay. So the fact that we are contiguous in in some physiological way uh, has made our disharmony possible. We're not quite to say that we're related, but we're physiologically contiguous. I'm not sure what that means. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, here is where I'm becoming interested. So we, we have all of this vitriolic outpouring against his mother and sister, calling them the poisonous burden. Now, one important scholar by the name of Mazzino Montanari said, oh, but this is all out of proportion to any, any, anything that, any, any, any treatment that he received from his mother and sister. They were, they were, they were within the, well within the parameters of family relationships. They were sometimes uh, not the ideal uh, relatives that one would have, but they certainly were not the horrible monsters that he's painting them to be here. He must have been crazy um, uh, to write this. It shows that he's got his fevered state of mind, his lack of, uh, his lack of control. But I, I, I'm not sure that that's all there is to it, because look at the next sentence. But, Having just said that, I must confess that the most profound objection against the eternal recurrence, my truly abyssal thought, is always mother and sister. Let's read that again. Wait, what? Having said all that, I, I, can, I must make a confession to you that I have always held my mother and sister that I, my personal confession is that uh, the, thought, the thought of 
the eternal recurrence of my mother and sister has been for me uh, the deepest objection to that idea. Say that again. The thought of my mother and sister, I, I, ha I personally have never been able to will the eternal recurrence of my mother and sister. Or let me say it a third way. The, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I don't think it would be authentic if there were not some occasional screw-ups. Just pull the just pull the legs out a little further so that they yeah, so that you and well at the same time keeping it relatively straight. <laughs> it's the first time we've used that tripod, so it's a little stiff. That's what happened. Now, Nietzsche's idea of the eternal occurrence isn't one of his major ideas. It might be the major idea. I don't think it's the major idea, but it was certainly the major idea of his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. He says so. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's a, it's, it's, we'll look at it in, uh, at some text in a moment. Uh, it's an idea of self-challenging, of uh, self-challenge. Uh, I, uh, I, I, by willing the eternal recurrence of the, of the past, I overcome my feelings of resentment and retaliation and renunciation of the world. How exactly that works, we'll study in a moment. But that's the idea. So it's a, it's a, self, it's a self imposed discipline meant to master uh, feelings of retaliation, feelings of renunciation. It's a self imposed discipline meant to master feelings of renunciation and retaliation. And if I can achieve it, then I have freed myself completely from all of that negativity. Okay, so what this section now says is, uh, you know what, in my own personal case, I have to make a confession that I've never been able to uh, free myself uh, using my uh, discipline of the eternal recurrence from my feelings of antagonism, renunciation, uh, and retaliation, wanting to strike back against my mother and sister. It says that. But what we really have to do is understand a little bit more about how the eternal recurrence is a self-discipline. Um, but if, that's, if we can make that case, uh, then the way to read this text is, here's what I look like mentally when I am not master of myself. I confess, <laughs> I couldn't do it. If that's the way it should be read, and that seems fairly clear that that's the intent here, then this is not a text that's out of control, this is a text that's quite in control. It's deliberately allowing, he's, he's deliberately allowing us to see the mind that in all other parts of Ecke Homo is kept under wraps by the mastery of, uh, of, of various uh, disciplines by which he uh, uh, keeps at, 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 at stable in himself what would otherwise be all-consuming feelings of renunciation, retaliation, wanting to strike back, vengefulness, vindictiveness, a whole uh, world of negative thoughts and feelings that plague him all the time. In Ecke Homo Wise 4, we said, no, oh, uh, I must be unprepared to be master of myself. And we said, what did that mean? And said, well, uh, he, uh, he, is so, he is so disposed toward, to feelings of renunciation that, uh, that uh, uh, he, uh, he, he has to prevent himself from having expectations for outcomes. Because if I, he says, if I allow myself to have expectations for outcomes, then I will be disappointed. So I will undermine the possibility of disappointment by being unprepared. I, I don't expect anything. I, I have no, no plan for anything at all to, have to, to, to happen. I'm up for any chance event. Anything that may happen is fine with me. Uh, I, I have no, no expectations. So I, and, I, and, 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 and the only reason for that is because I'm such a person who who, when faced with thwarted expectations, 
uh, reacts in a, in a very, very extreme manner, more so than other people. This is because of what came to me through my father. Uh, so in, in order not to succumb to those more extreme reactions, uh, I avoid any thwarted expectations. And the only way to do the, avoid thwarted expectations is to not have any. And in that way, I remain master of myself. And in Edgar Hall Wise 5, he said, well, when uh, I'm in a situation of someone uh, and someone who's done a wrong to me while I'm in the right, I master my feeling of wanting to strike back by taking the blame for the wrongdoing on myself. We talked about that. So those were two strategies in Nekehomo Wise 4 and 5, which, in which he uh, is struggling against what I call the first order psychology of compulsive thoughts and feelings of renunciation and retaliation by uh, developing a second order of strategy, a second order of psychology that undermines that first order of psychology from getting off the ground. I, I undermine thwarted expectations by not having any expectations. I undermine retaliating for the wrongdoing of the other by eliminating wrongdoing of the other from the world and making myself the guilty party for that wrongdoing. Which of course makes no sense from the viewpoint of moral thinking, but that's the idea. It's supposed to completely deconstruct the normal moral thinking of Christianity. And that's its point. And what has happened here? It didn't work. <laughs> this is exactly what he's telling you. In this particular case, I was unable to exercise the complex strategy of willing the eternal recurrence that would have allowed me to uh, master these terrible feelings. And in and, and not being able to master them, this is what I sound like. And that's why it's so completely out of proportion. I know it's out of I am out of proportion. I am out of proportion by definition. It's my whole story. And to be out of proportion and uh, trying to get back into normal parameters. In the case of my mother and sister, I tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and I couldn't do it. Here's, here's, what, it, here's what is left. Now that that then is readable, and it doesn't sound. So, then, so I'm suggesting, I want to talk a little bit more about eternal recurrence, but I'm suggesting that in this, in this section, uh, we, we can say things about the, the uh, uh, remark about having Polish descent that go back to as early as the summer of 1882, and there's a question that he was perfectly sane at that time. We can say things about connecting Dende to his new nobility, so that this sentence doesn't sound like it's a uh, a, uh, a megalomaniacal uh, claim to uh, divinity, the God, God like this, and we can say something here that uh, uh, accounts for why these, uh, this, the tone of that passage is, is out of uh, proportion to any reality of the treatment he received from his mother and sister. Okay. Um, now, um, I'll just want to draw attention. I just want to draw attention to one last section, one last sentence of this section three, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the. Uh, well, maybe I'll just skip that. Let's just skip that entirely. Um, let's skip that entirely and go to. Uh, Beginning here, this is uh, a section from the Spokes Arabic group called On Redemption. And uh, this uh, section poses a, 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 the problem.
problem that the idea of that his idea of the eternal recurrence is meant to solve. So it's really our starting point for the study of the eternal recurrence. Uh, start here. To redeem those who lived in the past and to recreate all it was into a thus I willed it, that alone should I call redemption. Uh, there's a contrast in between Christian redemption and redemption, but let's leave it for now. It's part of the revaluation of all values. Uh, let's look at just the psychology here. Uh, to recreate every it was into a that's the way I want it to be, I would call that redemption. Why? Will. That is the name of the liberator and joy bringer. Thus I taught you, my friends. But now you must learn this too. The will itself is a prisoner. What does that mean? Willing liberates, but what is it that puts even the liberator himself in, in fetters, in chains? It was. That is the name of the will's gnashing of teeth and most secret melancholy. What does it was mean? It, it, what the text is saying that the, the will is frustrated by the pastness of the past. The past happens and it's past and the will cannot reach it. It is beyond the reach of the will in its pastness. Even the liberated itself is, 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 is helpless before, the, before it was. Powerless against what his, has been done he is an angry spectator of all that has passed. The will cannot will backwards, and that it cannot break time and time's covetousness, that is the will's loneliest melancholy. Uh, willing liberates. What, does the will, what means does the will devise for himself to get rid of his melancholy and to mock his dungeon? Well, let, so, because the will cannot, because the will cannot change the past, it was is beyond the ability of the will to change. The will becomes uh, diseased, melancholy. And what does what does the will do? Uh, that time does not run backwards. That is the anger of the will. That which was is the name of the stone that the will cannot move. And so he moves stones out of anger, wrath, revenge and displeasure, and wrecks revenge on whatever does not feel wrath and displeasure. Thus the will of the liberator, is supposed to be the liberator, took to hurting, and on all who can suffer he wrecks revenge for his inability to go backwards. This is what revenge is. The, the will's ill will against time, and it's it was. This is an extraordinary piece of psychological analysis. Uh, what is the psychology of revenge? It's, it's, it's poetically form, form, uh, uh, presented um, and, uh, and extremely concise, but we can, we can, I have a handout I'll show you in a second where uh, I'll try to develop it in a little bit more analytical uh, detail. This is, what, this, is, this is the psychology of revenge, that the will can, uh, cannot uh, make time change. It cannot uh, 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 go back and change the way things have been. A great folly dwells in our will and has become a curse for everything human that this folly acquired spirit. The spirit of revenge, my friend, has been the subject of man's best reflection. Uh, and where there was suffering, one always wanted punishment too. For revenge is, punishment rather, is what revenge calls itself. Um, let's see. Um, uh, let's stop and go here. This is uh, uh, a section from uh, a post that I have on my blog site on this section. Much has been written on Nietzsche's idea of the eternal recurrence of the same from the point of view that its meaning is to be found in the psychological consequences of believing it. Uh, Let's skip that. I don't want to get into detail of that too much. These writings are philosophers of, of psychology, not psychobiologists, and they miss the point that the consequence in question is how and in what way the will acquires agency by doing so. The agency in question is that by doing the eternal recurrence of the same, 
The will is free to strengthen life against its resistances and thus make us become more alive. What's happened is this. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read it and then we'll go back. This, is, this old important section is not poetry and is not literature. It is psychobiology. Readings of the idea of willing the eternal terms are the same that do not address the problem of the agency of the will. <clears throat> the will is a prisoner. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's preoccupied with the pastness of the past. It's arrested in, 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 in futilely uh, wearing itself out, trying to change a past that cannot be passed, that cannot be changed. Because the will is wearing itself out, it is failing in its job of agency. It's supposed to be doing something. It's not supposed to be idly exhausting itself. Because it's idly exhausting itself, we're weakening, we're becoming weaker as a species. If, if, if we could arrest its idle exhaustion of itself and restore it to its true uh, uh, role as an agent, we could strengthen life in ourselves and become beings of overflowing life. That's the thing. Um, all right, let's get down to here. In our redemption, the problem supposedly solved by ruling the eternal recurrence is first posed. The following points can be stated with some confidence as having been Nietzsche's view, views. First, he believed that he had identified a great bottleneck hampering our development as a species. The principle of life is the will to power, the drive to master what resists life, and by mastering what resists it, strengthening life to make us more alive. By mastering life-weakening resistances in ourselves, such as compulsive thoughts and feelings of wanting to renounce, uh, to reference Nietzsche's own case, we create life in ourselves. Life becomes stronger and more. Being more alive shows itself in the character of Nietzsche's In Nietzsche's case, life became more in and by an excess of being more affirmative. The question of how we come to be alive is the central investigation of the subject of our evolution. And this is why in his notes he subtitles the will to power, uh, the, the book, The Will to Power, as an attempt at a new interpretation of evolution, how we become more alive. Uh, the problem of time that he poses is the problem of the pastness of the past. The will is suffering because of the pastness of the past, and it becomes revengeful as a result. Why? As though in a prison, the suffering will vengefully strikes out against life and others. It tries to imprison others' will and power with a vengeful morality of justice and punishment. Here's the scenario. In exercising mastery over its intimate weakness, the will to power must use the other as a means and not just as an end. Because if I if I, if, I, if I limit myself to only what uh, everybody else can do, um, I will never be able to do the exceptional things that I have to do, or the unusual things, or the uh, 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 dramatic things that I have to do to get control of my, uh, my particular weaknesses and strengthen them and create life in myself. But if I can do that, uh, then however I'm going about doing it, uh, if, even if it requires that I give myself privileges over another person, I should be able to do that. I should be morally allowed to do that because my result is the creation of more life in myself. And that result outweighs the, uh, the unequal treatment that I might have to uh, uh, give to others in the course of doing that. Uh, so it's, so, but the imprisoned will, vengeful in the grip of suffering, declares that the right to inequality is unjust and punishable. By forbidding the life strength and the exercise of the will to power, the will to equality achieves its vengeance on life. Uh, thus I cripple life, it says. So we, what, what I'm focusing on in this passage or paragraph is the idea that the will is because of its uh, imprisonment in, in being unable to reach the pastness of the past, which is beyond uh, its grasp in its pastness, becomes vengeful. Uh, and it becomes vengeful by striking out against all powerful wills and saying, no, I will not allow the will to power to act in an unequal way. We must
must all be equally the same. Uh, and by making us all equal, I am focusing on the will to power that could strengthen life to a higher degree and pro prohibiting it from doing so. By prohibiting it from doing so, I am effectively hurting life. And I know I'm hurting life. So the, 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 pre the person who is uh, an advocate of equal rights equal and equality uh, is, uh, is deliberately trying to undermine the action of will to power in the human being to create life, deliberately trying to undermine that so that life can be kept hurt and crippled. That's the vengeance. So the, the, uh, the doctrines of, the, of equal rights, according to Nietzsche, are based upon an idea a more a concealed idea of wanting to undermine will to power in order to have the satisfaction that life remains crippled and weakened in the way that will to power would like to uh, repair, but which equal rights prevents it from doing the things that's needed to repair. On redemption is a study of the effect of the pastness of the past on the will. We can question whether perhaps it need not have any effect on the will at all. And in the remote past, maybe it did not. But in modern humankind, it does. Nietzsche is silent on this point. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, he never discusses why it is that the will becomes angry be because of the pastness of the past. It may be that in 60,000 60, years ago, who knows, human beings might not have even formulated a past for themselves, even individually or historically. They may have just lived day to day. But somehow, as time has gone by, uh, we've become to reflect upon the past as something we want to change, and it wants us, and we're not able to just move forward in life uh, with each day being fresh and new without dragging behind us uh, all of the the sorrows and unhappinesses of the past that plague us. And maybe that was not always the case in human beings, but it's the case now. And the will is paralyzed in this obsession with wanting a different past. Um, okay. We want a different past, and we suffer because we cannot undo it. I want the past to be a different past. But the past is beyond my reach. Because I preoccupy myself with wanting a different past, and that's an impossible preoccupation, the will is paralyzed. Because it's paralyzed, it strikes out in vengefulness and is born the spirit of revenge. So that's, those, those are the obvious, I mean, it's still quite a lot to fill in, but that's the obvious uh, uh, map of what's going on in our redemption. The pastness of the past is paralyzing the will, uh, the, uh, because the will is paralyzed, it becomes vengeful and develops the concept of equal rights. Uh, and what we have, and, and somehow we have to address this. And whether or not it was always the case that the will was haunted by the pastness of the past, he doesn't say. But it is now. Maybe that, 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 that's, a, that's, that's a point where I like to think about epigenetics. Because uh, maybe we only became preoccupied with the pastness of the past as we have been accumulating inherited trauma epigenetically over generations, because we are now beginning to understand that trauma to our, our ancestors can be passed on to us, maybe not uh, uh, along with base DNA, but uh, the trauma remains in the uh, in, in our in our. Uh, in, the, in our environment, in the minds of our parents, our ancestors, and as we are uh, developing in the womb, our exposure to that psychological trauma affects us on, doesn't, doesn't change our base DNA, but it changes what is called the epigene, how the, how that, how the uh, base DNA, DNA is expressed, and we may be, in that way, actually accumulating past trauma. So well, that may be, uh, it's, I'm, I'm sure there's a reason why Nietzsche is silent on that issue, is how we ever came to be preoccupied with the past and the past. And it's difficult to imagine that we always were for our old history. You would 
think that, as I say, in our archaic past, we, who even knew we had a history, or even thought of past? Oh, my past. What's this, who's to say that humans constructed a past for themselves? They may have never moved their attention away from what's right in front of me, getting through today, trying to stay alive, not <laughs> finding stuff to eat, and never reflecting on past. So it may be that the whole, it may be that the whole obsession of the will with the uh, it, it unreachable pastness of the past, that may be something that's only developed in modern times, and it could be, as epigenetics is starting to unfold, it could be a heritable thing. That's all quite plausible. At any rate, where we are now is we want a different past, and we suffer because we cannot undo it. So there's, there's a profound insight here. There are gaps, but, that's, but, but you know, what's interesting to me is this is empirical psychology. It's not philosophy. I have no idea why philosophers think they can read nature and understand it. If, if any of this is true, it's true as an, as, as an empirical development of the human mind. And if the, if, 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 if the uh, discipline of willing the eternal recurrence can fix this, then, then that too is an empirical statement about the human mind and is not uh, 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 accessible to philosophical criticism one way or the other and only accessible to criticism from psychobiology and epigenetics. Okay. Than 
reconciliation because only the eternal occurrence, uh, only the discipline of willing the eternal occurrence of the same past uh, uh, puts us in a position to create life in us. And that's why it's a higher thought. Okay. I'm almost done with that, with this bit here. Just a little bit more. Uh, the spirit of revenge strikes out uh, against life and others for his suffering uh, from the pastness of the past wanting to see life hurt and crippled. Uh, uh, at this, all the same, the will is the only thing that can strengthen life in us as the will to power. So we have this dilemma. The will to power is trapped in the obsession with the pastness of the past. The best we can do is reconciliation with the pastness of the past, but that still isn't freeing the will. We need to uh, a higher relationship to the past that will really master the wanting it, wanting it to be a different past. And once we master wanting it to be a different past, the will will be free to create a strength in life in us. That's the issue of the agency of the will. All of and and that is very much like what he was saying in Eke Homo Wise Four. Oh, I must be unprepared to remain master of myself. Or in Eke Homo Wise Five. Oh, I will take the guilt for the wrongdoing of the other and upon myself, and then I will have eliminated wrongdoing against me from the world, and so there will not be an object to retaliate against. So similarly here, uh, by ruling the eternal recurrence of the past, I eliminate the past <laughs> and the preoccupation with wanting it to be different. And so the will is freed. The problem is to discover how the will can will such that it achieves power over these, over these life-weakening sufferings that arise because of the locked pastness of the past. So what can, what, how can I do my willing so that I get power over these terrible sufferings that, I, that arise in my mind when I think about the pastness of the past? How do I get rid of those terrible sorrows of the of a past that was misspent, or a past where I made mistakes, or a past where awful things happened to me. How do I get how do I get rid of all of that, all of those sorrows and sadnesses? Willing goes only in one direction, and that is the direction of the future. So, in order to will the past, to be the past that it is, that means willing that past to be in the future. That is, willing its eternal recurrence. Because willing only goes one way. If I if I if I'm looking back over the past and I want and I say now will that past instead of wanting a different past will that past to be the past that it is I don't know what to do because the will doesn't work that way it only works the forward way the you know, will moves forward so in order to engage the will to 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 will that pastness of the past to be what it is I have to move that past into the direction that will moves, which is the forward direction. So I have to will that past to happen in the future. If I can will the pastness of the past to happen exactly as it has in the past in the future, then I'm not preoccupied with changing it. So all those, but that means overcoming all of those terrible sufferings which could be all this long history of trauma that we've been accumulating. All those sadnesses, all those sorrows, all those awful things that happened to me. Now that's an extraordinary thing to be able to do. I mean, it's inconceivable that a human being can do that. Did Nietzsche do it? He just told you he didn't. I tried. But in my personal case, which is, and this is a personal issue because it's my past, in the case of my past, when I looked at the, the things that my mother and sister did to me, I'm sorry, I was so vulnerable to feelings of renunciation and retaliation and anger that I could not will them forward. And that's what I just showed you in that text. I, can't will them, I cannot will them forward and thus liberate my will to create life and affirmativeness in myself. I can't do it. And the fact that I can't do it is, is, is what I'm displaying to you in my out-of-proportion reaction to them. Uh, I have a 
question? Yes. <laughs> oh, let's do that. Since we never show any students, why don't we put Chloe oh. on? Do you mind? <laughs> we never show students. I, I think that people go on the site, they say, oh, he's just talking to an empty room. There are really no students there. There are real students here. Uh, if he wants to eliminate sorrow by using this way, then yes. will he eliminate his happiness? Because well, um, why would you? He, he, why would you say that? Why would you eliminate happiness too? Uh, because, because I think that uh, he didn't expect anything to come in the future because he, he wants to, uh, in my opinion, I think that uh, he, just, he, he, did, he did all these things because um, he wants he want everything, he wants every past is his will and every future will, will be his past and every future will be obey his will. I understand. Yes, all of what you're saying is right. Um, uh, something changes. Something changes. What's something? What is I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not willing the 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 pass forward uh, because I as as the as the end result of the exercise. That's not, that's not the, I, I don't get anything out of doing that just by itself. What's, what's happened is that I've, I've the, instead of the will being in that immobilized position and being preoccupied with the pastness of the past, I've moved it into a, a position of being an agent so that my feelings of vengefulness are now under my control, which were not before. But, but mm -hmm. not one second, one more, okay. one more. Because my feelings of vengefulness are under control, I'm strengthening life in myself. So what changes is I'm, when I was preoccupied with the pastness of the past, I was a vengeful, less alive being. Now that I've forced myself to will that past forward, I overcome and master that vengefulness toward wanting things to be different. And because I've mastered that vengefulness, I strengthen the liveness in myself. So I'm a more fully alive being. So the happiness that I have now is a happiness that I did not have before. It's a whole new universe of happinesses. Oh, I get it. See? Yeah, he's just a, he's really a crazy people, I guess. Yeah. And that's what I was calling the agency of the will. Now, if that's true, I don't really understand what resources philosophy has to assess if, that, if that's true. That by willing the uh, uh, past forward, I uh, master feelings of revenge, and, in, and revenge is a life-burning psychopathology, and in mastering the feelings of that life-burning psychology, I create life in myself. That to me seems to be a statement in the subject area of psychobiology, psychology and biology. Mm -hmm. Philosophical, so that this post begins with the difference between uh, purely psychological accounts of the effect of willing the return of recurrence versus the psychobiological effect of willing the return of recurrence. And the psychobiological effect is I'm more abundantly alive. And so who cares? I don't care about the past anymore. I don't care what happened to me. I don't care about my sorrow, my suffering, or what happiness is there. None of it matters. What I've done is, in becoming more richly alive, I've moved myself up evolutionarily on the scale beyond being human and, and further uh, evolutionary progression because I've developed life in route to the uh, next stage of human development, which he calls the overman. So by willing the eternal recurrence of the past, I master vengefulness by, because vengefulness is life, is, is, it burns up life in me, uh, mastering it, 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 it enables the will to uh, strengthen life in me, I'm more now richly and abundantly alive. I know a world of new happinesses that I've never known before, and I put myself on the pathway to the overman to come. 
However, I couldn't do it with my mother and sister. I confessed that. I confessed it. I said, I confessed. So having said all of those terrible things, I confessed that here I couldn't do it. So am I a, a super being of something? No, I, I'm a, a human attempting a, for the first time a project that we haven't even uncovered before. It's something brand new that I'm endeavoring to do here. I'm, I'm overcoming the accumulated trauma of past, uh, of, of past sorrow and that's been plaguing us in, in modern history. The, it, was I 100% successful? No. Was I somewhat successful? Of course. Of course. Was I successful enough to declare myself the person who should start the revaluation of all values? Yes. Okay. You can, you can stop it.